So to get started today, I'd like to welcome our guests, Mary Robinson and Dr. Angela Wepler. So welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Hello. So you're making time with us um, to talk about vaccines today. But before we get into that, we'd love to talk to you about you. So we'll start with a simple one. Mary, where are you from? I'm originally from Zeering, Iowa. Where is Zeering? Where is that? Yeah. It's an <laughs> itty bitty little town north and east of Ames in Nevada. It's okay. like 350 oh. people. Okay. I know where that itty is. Itty bitty. Okay. And how about you, Dr. Wepler? I'm from Griswold. I was born in Atlantic. Born in Atlantic. Here at Cass County Memorial Hospital? Yep. Excellent. That's so cool. Okay, favorite TV series, Dr. Wepler. Oh, favorite TV series. I don't watch a lot of TV right now. Um, or movie. Favorite movie, favorite, favorite book. Movie. Um, I mean, oh, well, Star Wars. We like all the Star Wars movies. I was going to guess but Na- the best Nightmare movie Before. of all time was The Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, oh, okay. That's the best. It is a good movie. It is a good movie. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so we could say favorite series, Indiana Jones, perhaps? Not the whole series. Not the whole just series. That one. Just, just that one. one. Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. All right. Mary. Well, current on TV, I guess, any of the NCISs, I like all those. Big Bang Theory was awesome, and it's gone. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. If you're cooking dinner to impress, what are you making? Well, if I'm going to impress Hunter... I'm making lobster bisque. Yeah. Oh, Hunter would be my baby. He's 18. <laughs> <laughs> he likes lobster bisque. Lobster bisque. Okay. Lobster bisque is delicious. I don't know. For me, it's any about anything. My father-in-law f- loves bread pudding, so I've been doing that for him. And my f- husband says he doesn't care. Anything is good to go. Bread pudding for the holidays or just anytime? Anytime. Anytime. Okay. $50 to spend locally. Where are you going? What are you getting? I'm going to Browns and I'm buying shoes. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> awesome. At least part of a shoe. Exactly. It, it probably <laughs> like eight, yeah, part of a shoe. <laughs> um, favorite holidays? Halloween. I've dressed up for Halloween for years. We have some outstanding photos of you dressed mm-hmm. up for Halloween. Yeah, mm-hmm. we have had a few. Yeah, yeah, COVID kind of put a halt to that. Halt to some of that, but yeah. yes. There's a, Hopefully like, next year. A Maleficent. This year. I remember. That was, yeah, I think that I was did the Maleficent. last one. That was a couple years ago. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I, was, I like the one when you dressed the boys up as uh, Anna and Elsa. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, my family, we used to go trick-or-treating in Griswold all the time as a group. Um, now they're all kind of getting old and we've faded out. But um, we'd go as a big group. And sometimes we would have themes. And usually the themes were boys' themes, like superheroes and supervillains and, and that kind of thing. And one year, the poor girls decided that they wanted to have – a theme and so we decided to be princesses and so my boys were princesses they were Anna and Elsa and I was Belle and outstanding yes. mm-hmm. magic. I love it I love it mm-hmm. she made a pretty good cat in the hat that year too oh yeah that's year we made our nurses dress up too they were thing one and thing oh. two and I was the fish in the fishbowl oh how funny <laughs> oh yeah I did a prosthesis and everything I had a little latex <laughs> thing going yeah. mm-hmm. all right so how about favorite holiday for you Mary well I'd probably have to say Christmas because it's the time year I actually get to see all of my siblings since we're scattered around central Iowa and get all the cousins together and that's fun to watch all of our kids play together now okay what will we never catch you doing checking my email (laughs) (laughs) it's very true if I ever want anything I call Angie G that's That's what I do I was gonna say I had to print off the email for today's (laughs) for her so she knew what was going on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and for me anything that has to do with heights I hate heights no heights. No heights. Mm-mm. Okay. No bungee jumping, no skydiving. No. Never. Yeah. Never. Mm-mm. Okay. Parasailing? No. M- mountains? Just going up in the mountains? Well, eh. Maybe. I don't like the switchbacks because I don't like those drop-offs. It yeah. freaks me out, too. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Makes my husband laugh. No heights required today, so you're good. I'm good. So what's better, the book or the movie? Do you have time in your lives for books? And I do audio books. Same. I don't know. Usually the book. Yeah, I would agree. And audio books, what are you listening to? Do you have a favorite genre? Uh, sci-fi, usually. Fantasy. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I do a little Dragons bit of everything. Dragons and that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, I do a little bit of everything. A little of everything. Okay. Dr. McCants, too. Sci-fi. Does he? Audio I'll books. I'll talk yeah. to him. Yep. I'll get some recommendations. Yeah. 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 There you yeah. go. Yep. Anytime he's got his headphones in, he's listening to a book. Mm-hmm. Which doesn't surprise me. Um, let's see, where are we at? You're driving alone in the car. What are we jamming to? I'm listening to my audiobooks. <laughs> it's my quiet time without the kids. Yep. 
Uh, it'll either be 80s rock, my old Guns N' Roses or Aerosmith, or it's going to be Broadway show tunes because I like to sing them. That's amazing. Yeah, I kind of want to like hop in the back seat and listen now. <laughs> um, pets. Any pets at home? A ton. I was going to say, Mary's got like <gasps> a, a menagerie. Ton. Really? We do have, we, we call it the uh, Robinson Zoo. Oh my gosh, tell me, okay. So we have a 10-year-old Wheaton Terrier. We have a 16-week-old Bull Mastiff puppy. We currently have two guinea pigs that will most likely have babies within the next two months. Again, that'll be their fourth or fifth set of babies. We have, let's see, we have Russian tortoises. We have a snapping turtle. We have yellow belly sliders. We have a uh, western paint. And then we have a ton of fish. We used to have a skunk. We don't have him anymore. He died. Um, we also have a pot belly pig that lives out at my husband's parents' farm. We used to have ducks and chickens, too. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. A it, lot. <laughs> what is a yellow belly slider? It looks it looks kind of like a western paint, but it's the What's underside. What's a western the bell- paint? It's a turtle. It's a turtle. Okay. <laughs> so the, the belly is actually yellow. Okay. Sure. Wow, that is. My husband loves turtles. It's a whole, what can I say? whole zoo. Okay. Correct. All right. Oh, we have axolotls, too. Wow. Is that a turtle as well? No, an axolotl is like a mud puppy. It's an amphibian. Oh, it has the frillies like that come the off thingies. the face. Yes. And they can regenerate yeah. their limbs. Cool. Wow. Mm-hmm. Any I pets? Have, I have Churchill, the English bulldog. Oh, yes. Oh. Church, yes. Excellent. That's okay. My boys name named him. Bulldog. I know. They named him after a British tank, not actually Winston Churchill, yeah. although I'm sure that's what the British tank was named after. Yeah. They're actually, they play a tank game and... They like Churchill tanks. Well, I don't know that they like them, but they thought that would be a good name. It seems like a good name for an English bulldog. Yes. It really does. <laughs> okay, last one. Next or dream travel destination? <laughs> Is it just Disney? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my kid's dream job, and we we have done a lot of Disney. Um, I, I have a couple bucket lists. I am going to see the Great Wall of China someday. Um, I've already been to Rome, and I loved it. Um, that was my 25th anniversary present to ourselves. Um, and then Egypt. But Clint says that's a little bit too unsafe right now. So we have to wait. Maybe forever if we ever wait for G- Egypt to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to go to like UK, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, that area someday. Hopefully in October we'll be going to Costa Rica if we can get all our ducks in a row. Oh, fun. fun. Oh, both both great. I love all these ideas. Mm-hmm. We'd like to know from our guests why they are in the fields um, that they work in. So we'll start off with just why medicine? What is it about healthcare that drew you in? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the path it took to get you to where you are now? So um, do you want to start? I don't care. Okay. So, so Mary, tell us more about your journey to becoming a PA. Um, when I was little, I knew I always wanted to go in medicine, even itty bitty. I said I wanted to be a pediatrician. I wanted to be in medicine. That was always my goal, never changed. Um, my mom was a nurse for 40 years. My grandfather was a physician for 42 years, and my grandma was his office nurse the entire time. And so as I progressed through school, Um, and was looking at starting to take the MCAT and looking at medical schools, my grandfather sat me down and said, the way I see medicine going in the next 25 years, you would be much better served for patients as a PA. He said, I see how medicine's going, especially in the rural areas. They're going to need PAs because there's not going to be enough physicians, period. He goes, do that. He goes, I know you want to have a family and you want to do medicine and be with patients. You will have that balance as a PA and not as an MD. So uh, on his recommendations, I looked into PA school and did my, um, my master's degree at Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska, and here I am. And how long have you been at Cass Health? I've been at Cass Health now for 12 years. It was my first and only job once I graduated from school. Awesome. And looking back on Grandpa's advice, was it the right advice for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I was little, I wanted to be a flight attendant because we used to play flight attendant with my uncle Ed when we were kids and it was amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I bet you'd make a great flight attendant. And then in junior high, I wanted to be an interior decorator because I thought that would be amazing. And then my sister 
who was legally blind before she had her eye surgery um, in junior high and then was no longer legally blind after that was done. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so decided I would want to go into medicine. And initially I looked at, I thought some subspecialties, um, maybe anesthesia, maybe ophthalmology. And then I decided, but what I really want to do is come back um, and be near my family. So I'm one of six kids. We're from Griswold, the Casey family. There's a bunch of us. Um, and I wanted to be closer to my parents. And as it turns out, my husband's family is from local as well. So we wanted to get back so that our kids could be near their grandparents. Um, and so we knew we wanted to do rural medicine and not subspecializing too tightly lets me serve way more people in the community than I would have been able to do had I picked a specialty. So we decided family medicine would make the most sense. Um, and I actually do love it because I like taking care of whole families. So I get grandparents and I get parents and I get the kids. Um, and I can deliver babies, but I can also take care of hospice patients and nursing home patients. And um, I don't ever have to leave them. Um, and I like that. Oh, and so, yes, I went to Creighton University undergrad um, and then University of Iowa Medical School for four years and then back to Clarkson Family Medicine, which is now um, one of the University of Nebraska um, family practice residencies, and then back here. And I've been here, it will be 20 years this summer, I think. Fantastic. Great answers. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> pandemic, vaccines have obviously been a hot topic, and it's something that we always talk about vaccines um, in healthcare because there's so many different types. You know, we have routine childhood, adult vaccines, and so it's something, you know, we're pretty used to talking about, but with a lot of misinformation and there's just this growing sense of mistrust, you know, we think it's important to get this topic out there and make sure we're addressing people's questions and concerns. So we'll start with some of these questions today. Just first and foremost, why are vaccines so important? You know, are some of these diseases really that bad? Well, we all know what COVID has done to the country. And influenza actually kills tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. a year. And prior to that, I think it, it has been interesting. You know, a lot of preventative medicine has taken a hit with COVID. People were afraid to come here because they were afraid of getting sick. Um, for a while, offices were closed down and not doing, not every office was doing um, as much as they had had available to patients forever. We weren't able to do colonoscopies for a while. Um, and so we've lost a lot of preventative medicine and we're trying to play a little catch up because, you know, we've lost some cancer screenings um, over the last couple of years. And, and that's important that we get people caught up. We've had some people who've had heart attacks who maybe wouldn't have had heart attacks had we not missed a few visits over the last few years. And vaccine is just one of those preventative medicine things that's been an issue. And it's tough. You know, we are living in a generation where we have never seen measles. We've never seen a baby whose mom had rubella and the congenital deformities that those kids can have. We have never seen polio. Um, and actually, a lot of our post-polio patients Most are now dead. dying out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have a whole generation who doesn't know how bad and how contagious some of these diseases are. It's hard to look at the rates in a country who's reasonably well vaccinated and think, well, yeah, well my kid's not going to get exposed to measles, so why do I need to... Um, vaccinate for measles. And we're seeing pockets and areas that don't vaccinate well getting measles again. And measles has a couple of very severe complications that can cause lifelong damage to little kids. Um, and that's tragic when it happens. Um, and it's completely preventative and the vaccines are exceedingly safe. And the virus itself, once it gets going, is exceedingly contagious. And uh, we've seen what exceedingly contagious can look like with COVID. So it's tough for young parents to see their baby hurting because they got shots and not want to hurt them and not know the benefits, not comprehend the benefits because the benefits are on, they're kind of so far away. They're so intangible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea like, like, well, I've never heard of anyone ever getting polio, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that sense of like, is this a real threat or not, you know? So, but you're right. It's about that preventive care. Um, mm -hmm. And it's about community care. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of being an American. Mm -hmm. You should feel some responsibility to everyone in your community, to everyone in your country, and doing your part 
is vaccinating and vaccinating your children so that they're not part of a pro- potential problem, a huge outbreak that could potentially kill people you don't know you killed. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and tiny babies in measles case. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you look at third world countries that don't have what we have here, as far as vaccines go, we see those issues with measles killing children and kids having polio and things like that because they just don't have access to mm-hmm. it. And it's just sad to see. It's still very real, not in the United States, but it's still a very real threat. But with mm-hmm. international travel being so easy. Yes, that too. Right? If you're under vaccinated or unvaccinated and you bring it back to an under vaccinated community, you could really cause significant harm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is the schedule for childhood vaccines really that important? Yes, <laughs> because there are some of the things that we vaccinate kids for if we don't vaccinate them at a certain time period, if we wait a long time, one being rotavirus, mm-hmm. if we don't vaccinate early for it, there's really no point as you get older because it's no longer a risk at that age. Right. So with rotavirus, we're trying to keep kids from getting so terribly dehydrated that they have to be admitted to the hospital for fluids. And the o- only when you're tiny... Do you get dehydrated that fast? Um, and it's that, those are the kids it's really life-threatening for, are the littles. So if you wait until they're bigger, well, then they're no longer, you n- the benefit is no longer there. Um, same thing with some of the meningitis vaccines. You know, the, the bacterial meningitis, the Haemophilus influenza, and the pneumococcal, these bacterial meningitises that we're trying to vaccinate for, we're trying to prevent meningitis in littles, little infants. Um, under ones, under threes, um, where the rates of death from infectious disease in that three-year and under population, that's when it's really bad for them to get whooping cough. It's really bad for them to get influenza. Influenza. The death rates in kids under three are higher than the three to 65s. And then you've got your elderly people who are considerably more at risk for death and hospitalization. But those littles, it's important. And there are some vaccines too that... um like I think about the HPV vaccine, mm-hmm. you know, like that 11 and 12 year old people will say, well, gosh, that seems so young. But that's like when my understanding is and my very non-clinical mom understanding, like that's when the body is like primed and like ready for that vaccine. Like the immune response is better. So like there's there's reasons too why some ages mm-hmm. you could mm-hmm. do some of those vaccines. And with right. The- and you, I mean, if you wait until they're sexually active, you've You're, missed your you've window. Missed your window. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and we're already doing vaccines at mm-hmm. that age for meningococcal Mm -hmm. um, and they're usually you need a tetanus booster at that age anyway so it just kind of makes sense yeah to to time it there and we're down to just two shots on the hpv series instead of three so yay yay i've Mm -hmm. got a kid do so (laughs) that's great news (laughs) and the other thing too with the schedule as far as infant and childhood vaccines is you know we understand when we see them for wild child checks that they may not be feeling well and we need to skip vaccines that day but we purposely have a break in there to play catch up if it's needed so and then i mean even when we get to the teenagers we're t- vaccinating from meningococcal because we're helping to get that boost in their system before they go off to college when they're, they're living they're in rate. dormitories where we have and their risk is much higher than when their risk is much much is higher now. for meningitis and that's why we try to get them boosted before we send them off into areas that we know will can have issues yeah mm-hmm. and meningococcal meningitis that's a big and bad scary yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're in the prime of their life they got their whole life ahead of them and then Mm -hmm. they get hit by the bacteria it's not good Mm -hmm. so have you seen a change in your patients um over the last couple of years when it comes to hesitation about vaccines yes i some of it is you know it does seem like a lot of pokes they're getting and actually there have been some changes in vaccines that's i think going to get us down to never needing more than two pokes per visit ever which is a is a drop because we've usually do sure. three three or four, um yeah. at the two four and six so yeah it's we're trying to do our best to try to combine things as much as we can so that we can get as much done with its little pain to the babies as we can um and th- so that's a huge improvement um and then you know the internet has been difficult 
you can get some great information out there and you can get some really awful information out there. And there have been people who's, for some reason, think that vaccines have harmed them or one of their loved ones, and they have made concerted efforts to try to get nobody to vaccinate. Um, And that's very short-sighted because the risks to vaccines are exceedingly low. The potential harm is starting to stack up there now because it hurt the COVID vaccine something awful this 20 years of people bad-mouthing vaccines on Facebook and social media really, at that point, carrying no responsibility or not making any effort to make sure that what's put out there is truthful. And the way algorithms work uh, in these social media platforms, if you click on something that's bad information, you're going to get more bad information. So it's very hard for people to kind of separate that. And once you see it, even if you don't really believe it subconsciously, if you see enough of it, it can make you wonder. And that's been, it's been hard. Um, what I can tell people is my family's fully vaccinated. Mary's family's fully vaccinated. Yeah. It's, it's been a long couple of years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was just wondering, like, what types of questions are you getting? Like, like, do you get, do people say, is this vaccine safe? You know, like, wh- what are those questions? Or do people just not ask you questions about vaccines? Do they just say no? I think a lot of people's mind have been made up before they come in Mm -hmm. um i think we do get some um and we get really smart questions i mean it's very reasonable to be concerned you know there were some early concerns out there with covid vaccines and teenage teenagers whether or not there were myocarditis issues Mm -hmm. which were rare um and certainly considerably less than your risk of getting that same problem from getting from the COVID. disease. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and initially, when COVID was slightly less contagious, there was some balance and it was a reasonable decision to look at risk versus benefits and say, well, you know, my kid's careful or my kid's homeschooled and we are probably not going to get exposed. And then it became more contagious. We had the Omicron, which at this point, it's not realistic to think you're not going to get COVID. I think you're either going to get vaccinated or you're going to get COVID or you're going to get both. And the likelihood is we'll both prob- most of us will probably get both, um, at least those of us that decide to vaccinate. But the hope is, and the evidence is bearing that out, that if you are vaccinated, your chances of hospitalization and death are exceedingly, exceedingly lower than somebody who was not vaccinated. And that's really important. It's important to the hospital systems and the overwhelmed the overwhelmed feeling that we've had and the burnout with all the nurses and doctors and you know, us not being able to get people transferred to the city uh, because the cities are full. Um, and uh, the COVID patients, when they're real sick, they take up beds for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's been a very hard thing for, for the healthcare system to try to absorb. And so not, not having to put yourself in that situation is really good. Right. So viewing right. that vaccine as preventive care, like yeah. how can I prevent the situation mm-hmm. for myself or my loved right. ones? Yes. I can do that by choosing the vaccine. And some of these illnesses, the complications are not necessarily that I'm going to die or not, but there are long-term risks from getting these diseases. It's not just about whether or not you die. It's whether or not you have permanent heart damage or whether or not you've had a blood clot in your lung and you're going to have to live with the damage from that for the rest of your life. Whether or not you have a heart attack from your COVID and you have to live with that for the rest of your life. Whether or not you get scarring from your pneumonia that you got from your influenza and you have to live with that for the rest of your life. It's not all whether or not I live or die. It's whether or not I can live as well as I could have lived had I not gotten that disease in the first place. The polio, pa- the post-polio patients who were paralyzed or weak for the rest of their lives. It wasn't about whether or not they died from the polio. It was about whether or not they could live the life that they could have had without it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was saying, I have a family that it's been a few years back though, is um, the mom ended up having two children of her own with, she's had um, severe allergies to multiple different things. And her sister had a horrible reaction to MMR. And so they kind of backed off doing some of the vaccines for the rest of the kids because of that. But her and I sat down and talked and she wanted to see if it would be safe for her kids to go through vaccines. And I flat out told her, I said, what we can do is we can do a slower introduction and get your kids vaccinated because it does not mean because your sister had such a horrible outcome with one, it does not mean that your kids will have the same outcome. And mm-hmm. so we worked together and we, ex- I went, we went through each vaccine piece by piece with her and mm-hmm. we did a slow introduction and 
her kids did not have reactions and they are all vaccinated for their age at this point. So, so. the takeaway here is ask. Yep. Yeah, Talk questions. to your provider and figure out a plan together, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And have that face to face conversation and mm-hmm. stop Googling it. Right. <laughs> it's it's tough. Find, it's a, tough. find someone you trust. And if you're going to use the internet, use reputable sites yes, like the use CDC. Use a site that you trust. It's great. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you have a favorite health system, if you really trust the Mayo Clinic, go to their website. They have good information on there, they'll have good links to help you. Go to the University of Nebraska or the University of Iowa and start there and branch your branch your search out from there but they will put on good information if you trust them start with them don't i mean if you've never heard of the website that you're going on it's, it's a red flag right it's there. it's a red mm-hmm. flag that you can't trust that information mm-hmm. so hbv comes to mind as a vaccine that definitely gets embroiled with some misinformation i remember when it came out i was a teenager when it came out so let's talk how do you guys talk to parents and patients about adolescents and young adults and the benefits of the HBV vaccine. We kind of touched on it a little bit, but that's one that I remember. So with my patients, because it was a huge hot topic when I was in PA school mm-hmm. about whether you vaccinate or not vaccinate, is it going to make our teenagers more promiscuous mm-hmm. or not promiscuous? Mm-hmm. And what it really boils down to is giving it at the age it's recommended is it helps protect them as they get older. We know in this day and age they're, we know the kids are younger and younger becoming sexually active, multiple partners. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things. Once you get HPV, it's yours to keep. So if we can prevent cervical cancer, if we can prevent even, we have seen an uptick in, um, oral cancers because of HPV. Mm -hmm. If we can help protect those kids from getting that, why not? Right. And Dr. Wepler has what she says to patients is amazing too. Well, if your child never becomes sexually active before they get married, which is possible, and you're confident in that, you can't be confident that their future spouse is going to be abstinent until they get married. HPV would be the worst wedding present ever to get. So you, we, might, we might need to put that on a Hallmark card. If you trust your kids, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you trust your kids, that's cool. But I don't. But if you want to protect them from everybody you can possibly protect them to, that actually could include their future spouse. Um, and just getting it done now, and it's again very low risk, and we're down to just two shots. It's it's worth doing because I've dealt with people who who have had recurrent abnormal Pap smears from there, and it is. It's a lifelong fear, and then they get anxious when they have to come in to see us because is it going to be abnormal again? Is it going to be abnormal again? It's it's an awful thing to have to worry about, and it is so preventable. And how many cancers can we say are prevented by we a vaccine? Can prevent? I mean, it's a mm-hmm. miracle that we can keep our kids, that we know we can keep our kids from getting this one cancer. If you could do that for breast cancer, if you could do that for colon cancer, people would bend over backwards. It's huge that we know that almost all cervical cancer is related to this virus. And if we prevent this virus, we prevent that possible problem for our family. And it's, it's, it's neat. Mm-hmm. I also think COVID was a miracle when that vaccine came out because it was way more effective than we ever thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. It was a big deal. What about the cost of vaccines? If I'm a parent and I don't have insurance, but I, I'm interested in getting my kids vaccinated, um, is there any program to help me? Absolutely. Absolutely. So for the nice thing about the state of Iowa is if your child is under 18, you do not have insurance. We have vaccines we can give you because of what the government has in place. And beyond that, if you have insurance, but your insurance doesn't cover Cover vaccines, we can use you are in that program as well. So if we call that underinsured, if your insurance doesn't cover the vaccines, then you are eligible for that vaccine as well, and there will be no cost. And that is a huge yeah. benefit of being a taxpayer. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, and that's something that, again, like I can ask in a, like my regular well child checkups and whatnot, you guys are going to be checking for those things, you know, mm-hmm. am I up to date or whatnot? And then if I have a concern and say, you know, I, I am um, wanting to get those vaccines done, but I'm concerned. You guys will help us navigate to the right person in the immunization room and everything. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good. Even with adult vaccines, if we're concerned about cost, I mean, we have our, I mean, 
we always tell everyone to check your insurance, but that's something that our, um, like Steph Lansdowne can help with too. Oh, our patient, as, our patient financial advisors. Yes. yes. They can help us with that information as well. Good. So always ask. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause there's some crazy insurances out Insur there. Well, mm -hmm. and what Medicare, whether or not Medicare will pay for a tetanus shot depends on whether or not you have an injury. So you need to get your tetanus shot when you're Medicare aged, when you have a scratch or an injury that would be tetanus prone, whether or not Medicare pays for the shingles vaccine depends on where you get it. So Medicare patients need to get it from their pharmacy, mm -hmm. not in the clinic. So there's really, there is, yes. <laughs> so yes, if you need a Shinrick shot, you want to get it done before you're 65 because your private insurance will cover that. Good and you can know. get it and if you're 65 and older, then you have to go through the pharmacy. You have to go through the pharmacy. And, and we have to send them a prescription for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. huh. That, that, wow. Wow. <laughs> so it can get complicated it and can, we're yeah. happy to walk people through that. That's part of what the preventative health is, health visit is about. Is so knowing all those nuances of like, mm -hmm. like, okay, we need to get these vaccines done, but this is how we're going to tackle it and how we're going to get it done. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about adults. There are some really key and wonderful vaccines for adults. So let's talk about those. Which well, we have the pneumonia shots. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be some change in that. I've joked with my patients for years. You're up to date until the government changed their mind. Um, and the, the CDC changes their mind. And they get a new mm -hmm. vaccine they want you to get. Um, there's a new pneumonia shot out there. But it is, they're kind of rolling this one in to be a little bit easier for patients. So, if you've had a pneumococcal already, you don't need it. If you turn if you turn 65, you do. You can get it, and then it's a one. So right now, everybody's had to get a, a PCB13, which is one of the pneumonia. They've had to get two. There are two. Now there's going to be one, and it's a one shot. After 65, now there are also some other criteria for people to get it, but what you need to know is if you've already had a pneumonia shot, you don't need this new one. So they're going to try to just clean it up and make it simpler. Mm -hmm. But that is a change. Um, and that's all about pneumonia. And pneumonia is as a killer. Get, yep, as you get older. Mm -hmm. And that's why we vaccinate again when you turn 65. Mm -hmm. Just trying to And then if you have prevent. other, if your, mm -hmm. immune, if your immune system isn't working well or if you have heart disease or lung disease and are more mm -hmm. prone to... Um, getting really sick if you're diabetic and more prone to getting hospitalized and really sick uh, from pneumonia, you can get it a little bit younger. So come ask us. We'll sort it out. Mm -hmm. And how about Shingrix? So Shingrix is two, it's a two-shot series to help prevent shingles because nobody really wants shingles. It hurts. Um, and it can some, hurt for the rest of your life. Yes, there's long, can some, be a certain population. long-lasting complications. Um, and like we were talking before, if you're under, so you're eligible for that when you turn 50. Um, so for 50 to 64, that usually is covered by your private insurance or if you have um, uh, like state insurance like a Medicaid, um, they usually cover it. But then once you hit 65, it changes to where it has to go through the pharmacy and then it's subjective to your supplemental deductible. So, and I, so I always encourage my patients to get that one done before they turn 65 because I've had patients tell me that that shot can cost anywhere from... 200 to 250 dollars mm -hmm. per vax per injection mm -hmm. so as i always push to make sure you want to get this done before you're 65 because it doesn't cost you anything at that point right and then otherwise as far and if as you've met your deductible check with them again exactly um because you may now not have to pay a dime for it because yes. you've already paid enough mm -hmm. um, and then with the shingle shot so the shingrix is the new shingle shot yep. there is the old shingle shot and should you get the new shingle shots? If you got the old shingle shot, the yes. answer is yes. It is more effective than the Zostavax was. So, yes, you should. Because you can't even get the Zostavax anymore. No. Oh, okay. They took it off the market because Shinrix is that, is, that, is that much, much better, more effective. Much better, yes. Okay. Hmm. But uh, otherwise, as far as other adult vaccines, obviously tetanus every 10 years. Mm -hmm. We highly recommend influenza shots every single year because influenza is deadly in our young and our old. Um, and then, and it keeps you out of work for seven to 10 days, which is yes. a real reason to get it too. I mean, you stay, you're sick for a while with influenza. So, you know, just from a convenience and not missing work standpoint, it's nice mm -hmm. to not have a disease that's going to get you down for that long. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And mm -hmm. then they just came out with the fourth booster for anyone over the age of 65 for COVID. 
or who have immunocompromised, which is a long list of things, and you're certainly welcome to call us and see if you qualify. Throughout the pandemic, there's been this growing sense of frustration for many people, and we hear a lot of people say, I'm just not sure who to trust anymore. Um, and, you know, Dr. Weppler, you talked about this a little bit with, like, seek out the sources that you do trust. So if that's Mayo Clinic, go there. What do you say to those patients? And, you know, just to put it simply, are vaccines safe? They are. I mean, mm-hmm. as with any medication or treatment, there are going to be a certain number of people who get certain side effects. Now, mm-hmm. typically, it's body aches and fever. And a lot of people will say, I got the flu from the flu shot. Well, you didn't get the flu from the flu shot. You got a reaction to the flu shot. An amazing immune- immunity response is right, what I call it. Good news. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> kind of. It's that good means news. your body recognized it, and it's fighting and ready to fight it again. It's not all bad. It might knock you down for a day or two. It's not usually nearly as long, obviously, as either COVID or flu would knock you down. Um, so take your ibuprofen, drink your fluids. Maybe get it on a Friday so that you've got the weekend Mm -hmm. to recover from it if you're worried you might have a reaction. Um, But still definitely worthwhile getting because what you don't get, again, and there were some questions with the J&J and Mm -hmm. blood clots, and there were some questions with some uh, myocarditis. Those are exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare, and considerably less prevalent than how sick people are getting from the actual virus, which with influenza, you can't 100% count on getting, but with COVID, you pretty much can 100% count on getting that virus at some point. And protecting yourself is important. May not be your number one priority. I mean, but protecting the people you love, the fragile people in your life, is another thing to think about. So do you have a family member who's had a stroke or had a heart attack? Or is it risk for a stroke or a heart attack because or a blood clot of some sort, because those are big complications from COVID. Um, Do you have somebody who's got bad lungs? Do you have somebody who's got cancer? Do you have a little tiny baby or a pregnant woman that you're trying to protect? It's okay. And actually, I'm very proud of you and respect you and give you all the props for only getting the vaccine for the people you love, because you don't care if you die from it or if you have a problem with it, but you do care about your family. And I, I think it's a really good reason to get vaccinated. And coming from someone who I react every year to the flu shot. Always Me have. too. Always have. And I know I'm going to have a sore arm and have body aches and not feel great, but it doesn't stop me from protecting my family. I have in-laws and my patients. that need extra protection, my parents, my children. I got my COVID shots because my kids, one, one can get it now and I need to get her scheduled for it who hates shots. She told me that she would totally do everything she can to stop the virus if it Aww. didn't include shots. Sweet Aww. Pete. Aww. And I have a three-year-old who still can't get the vaccine, but I, it doesn't even cross my mind if it has to be done to protect those I love and take care of in the clinic. It, I will gladly go through the few days of discomfort mm-hmm. to help protect mm-hmm. them. And frankly, to keep us working because mm-hmm. if I'm out a week, that's a lot of patients that don't get seen. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. A lot of work for everyone else who works with me to try to make up for the lost time when I wasn't available to my patients. And so there's lots of reasons, too. Mm -hmm. It's a big question is what's your why? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I mean, I I remember feeling guilty getting my vaccine, my code vaccine here, because I was like, I'm like, but I'm not I'm not on the front line. You know, I'm not I we could. Can I send this to like a doctor or nurse who doesn't have theirs yet? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, and I just remember feeling kind of guilty, but like overwhelmingly grateful and as soon as it's available for Mary and Maggie, I got them vaccinated. And same with Johnny and Lucy, you know, mm-hmm. like, like I want to do my part for them. And then for, for my parents, you know, for mm-hmm. my husband, for everybody else around us, you know, mm-hmm. I want mm-hmm. to do what I can. So. And these junior high kids, these high school kids, these school aid kids, they've lost so much to COVID already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of them lost to prom and some of them lost choir concerts and track seasons and golf seasons. Graduations. And graduations. Oh, yeah. All those big miles. Mm-hmm. Um, school trips yes yeah mm-hmm. so well even our littles not being able to be no in trips. school i right. still hear about and the i never got to go to the zoo mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you right. know so and sad. that's big in their it's world huge. Yes. it's huge it's, yes. it's, it's it's things they look forward to the whole year mm-hmm. and so they've lost so much if we can vaccinate them and that makes them less likely to lose more that's great mm-hmm. you know hunter was fully vaccinated got covid anyway missed his last football game we missed parents night you know that hurt but he was only mildly sick and my and he's got asthma we still got lots of benefit from that vaccine my kid was back singing 
and auditioning for Allstate by the end of the weekend, and they let him do it on virtually. God bless him, because they're you know the school's trying to to not let your kids miss any more than they than they can. But yes, I'm not so worried your kids are gonna end up hospitalized with COVID. They can, and teenagers mm-hmm. can die. Uh, it certainly has happened. But getting diagnosed and missing seven to ten days of school, that's a lot. That's mm-hmm. a lot of missed school. That's a lot of possible events that they might never get back and it hurts okay. and it's their whole world right now the other you know in 10 years they can look back and say oh i did the right thing right now they're just like i didn't get a good prom mm-hmm. i can never get that back so vaccines are meant to prevent disease um and i can see some people have a frustration because well i got the vaccine and i got sick Still got anyways mm-hmm. but you guys i mean you've been in practice for a long time you've probably seen the difference between a vaccinated person who is ill and an unvaccinated person who's absolutely Mm -hmm. and like one be funny thing is i remember getting chicken pox as a kid Mm -hmm. i have not seen chicken pox clinically since i started 12 years ago because of the varicella vaccine Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and again most of us got it and it wasn't a big deal it wasn't a big deal had chicken pox had chicken pox had chicken pox Mm -hmm. i have a scar in my eye i had a chicken pox in my eyeball Oh. Yeah, but like there, there's like we're right at that cusp. And of like, we're yes. all and we're all at risk of getting shingles, shingles sometimes, now. which yes. could co- cause us lifelong pain. Right. If Our kids who never had chicken, chicken pox will are not at never risk. be at risk of getting um, shingles, which is huge. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our kids right. will never, you know, if they never if they never get chicken pox mm-hmm. when they're pregnant, they're never going to have a baby born with damage from that virus. You know, there are certain times and, and there are severe cases where they get it in their brain. Mm-hmm. It's exceedingly rare, but when it happens and when it's a disease that pretty much everybody can count on getting, when you extrapolate that to the entire population of the United States, you have a significant number of people who are permanently damaged from viruses. And it's hard to look at your one little person's risk and think about the risk nationwide. But I've been, I've had medical problems where I was the one in a million and it's awful. It's awful to be the one in a million. And it's awful as the parent of a kid who is the one in a million that you th- you would never want to have to look back on it and say, I could have prevented this, but I didn't. Um, you never want to be in that situation where you have to second guess choices you made. Yeah. Yep. As parents, I think we all were drawn to do whatever I can to protect that child mm-hmm. and keep right. them healthy. And mm-hmm. vaccines are a big right. part of that. Absolutely. Right. For, for them and for us and all the people in our lives. Mm-hmm. Well, Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, It was a joy to talk to you both. We hope you come back. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.